Здравейте, добра вечер. Започваме днешния епизод с Гюнтер Фурман. За него това, което може да се каже накратко, той е австрийски гражданин, а, завършва право, но в момента от доста време, от години работи като независим изследовател а, и арт-менеджер, нека да го кажем така. Обаче, интересното около него е това, че той наистина направи история. Той направи история, свързана с това, че дълги години той е част от хората, които са активно свързани с връщането на тлените останки на цар Фердинанд в България. Той следва династията на Кобургите в детайл и освен това, както казах вече, той е тясно ангажиран, свързан с процеса по връщането на саркофага с тлените останки на цар Фердинанд в България. Днес той е мой, мой събеседник и вярвам, че това е един изключително важен разговор за България, за нашата история и за нашето място в Европа. Ето го и него в контракоментар. So, Mr. Фурман, uh, thank you for being my guest. Welcome on my show. Good morning. Good morning. It's an honor. <laughs> thank you. It's an honor for me. So let's, let's start with a little history. In uh, October uh, 1918, uh, Ferdinand abdicated as a Tsar of Bulgaria, as Bulgarian king. Vienna, that's the city where he was born and where he grew up, uh, wouldn't, uh, it would have been a nice place for him to stay, but Austria refused him asylum, and so he heads to the small German town of Coburg, back to his uh, dynastic roots, the roots of his family, which has given Europe many rulers, such as Prince Albert, for example, the husband of the British Queen Victoria, as well as uh, the Queen herself. Uh, so... Uh, I believe that what happened last week uh, with the transport of the Ferdinand uh, remnant, uh, remains uh, to Bulgaria, to their bureau uh, place in Bulgaria, is an extraordinary and remarkable event. Every expert I've talked and I've spoken to, he is of the same opinion that such event never happened before, so to say. So how did uh, Coburg, the city of Coburg, say goodbye to the Bulgarian king? Uh, yes, I... I believe that this event was was truly was truly historic and it never happened before and I would say it will never it will never happen again. And how Coburg said goodbye was very, very touching. It was a very tranquil, dignified, emotional way. Uh Ferdinand was buried there for 76 years and the interest in him, his branch of the family grew in the last years. Before Coburg identifies more uh, with its connection to the British royal family, to the Belgian royal family. But uh, in the last years, lots of research happened connected with the Kohari branch, the branch of the family Ferdinand comes from. Uh, the church of St. Augustine, where his remain rested, got renovated. The crypt got open. And many, many people came to visit this crypt and also to know more about Ferdinand and his family. And also, I was there. Ferdinand was, Ferdinand's coffin was brought to the church of St. Augustine on Monday that the people of Coburg can say goodbye, can say farewell to the king. And I know the, the, the uh, responsibles, the priests, the parish from St. Augustine very well since years. And they said, have you have no idea if people will show up? And then they had been very, very surprised how many people came in the afternoon uh, to have a last yep. meeting in a last encounter with the coffin and also at the service at 5 p.m the church actually was packed the the service was very very dignified so it was it was Coburg is a is a protestant town the catholic parish is a minority and so they made it they made it very very uh economical uh very very uh ecumenical sorry and uh Prince Andreas, the head of the, uh, the sex Coburg family, was present. The mayor, lots of deputy mayors, uh, local politicians, the Bulgarian ambassador in Germany, uh, some Austrian aristocrats, 
traveled to Coburg. So it was it was quite it was quite an event. And it was interesting how people spoke about uh, Ferdinand and, and this event. They said, for us, we expected it, that the day will come, that he will leave us. Because mm -hmm. he was buried yeah. in a Reisesarg, so in a, in a coffin for travel. And yeah, now... this, is, uh, this is the image of that uh, coffin, yeah. Maybe uh, I'll show it uh, just a second. Yeah, uh, maybe you could say more about the meaning of this uh, traveling coffin, so to say. Why, why is it, why, is, why his body was placed, his re uh, remains was placed in such a coffin? That's it. Uh, the coffin is different to all the other coffins in the crypt of St. Augustine. All the other coffins are made out of marble, so not movable. Mm -hmm. His coffin is in a, in a wooden sarcophagus covered with red velvet. And it was called Reisesar, so coffin for, for traveling. And Ferdinand stated that now he wants to be buried there and later moved to a final resting place. Yeah, actually we, we are touching the subject of uh, this uh, indeed remarkable event. Um, a few more words about why is it so impressive, uh, even from the point of view of the standards of uh, the other European dynasties? That after such a long period, I mean, he died in 1948, uh, this translocation was, was undertaken, that it was seen, it will close now an open chapter in a history book. Uh, and this, I think, is it's it's the main mm -hmm. the, the greatness the greatness of, uh, of of this occasion. So an unfinished chapter comes comes to an end. Uh, what is what is the role, uh, so to say? I mean, not the presence. I'd say what's the pres uh, the presence of the abdicated Bulgarian king. king uh, still could be found in the city of Coburg, not only when it comes to some ceremonial procedures. Uh, anyone, anyone who is getting married in Coburg, he, they, the couple, must enter the Ferdinand's former residence, a palace uh, near the state theater known locally as the Bulgarian Palace, the Bulgarian Theater. Uh, today, um, it houses the civil department of the town hall. In, in uh, Vienna, however, one can also still find traces of, the, of uh, Ferdinand, uh, his uh, family, so to say. Uh, everyone is talking about the uh, uh, infamous... Anyway, that will be the second question, about the infamous um, Landmann Café, but that will be the second part. Please uh, say a few more uh, words about the uh, traces of Ferdinand, so to say, in Coburg as well as uh, Vienna. I have to correct you. There are there are two houses Ferdinand used to live. Okay. One was the so-called Bulgaren Schlössel or Bulgaren Villa, uh, which was a 19th century building in this in the gardens in the great Hofgarten, the great park of Coburg. Uh, tragically, this building was demolished in the 1960s. So Ferdinand used this building when he arrived in Coburg and later in summertime. Where he died, that's the so-called Augustenpalais or Burglas Palais. This was the building uh, the Kohari branch of the family owned. So it was the, the palace of Ferdinand's family. And so, of course, he stayed there. Uh, now uh, it was purchased by the city of Coburg after Ferdinand's death and they established the center for civil weddings there. It's one of the most beautiful weddings locations in Germany. And there is a small exhibition about Ferdinand and his life uh, in the building. Mm, I'm trying to find. Yeah, that's it. That should be the place of the wedding. Exactly. Yeah, okay. And then uh, another another part of the story, which I believe is not quite well known, and there are a lot of speculations. Uh, it's related exactly to this, I would call it, infamous uh, Landmann Cafe, next to the uh, Burgtheater. 
where supposedly Ferdinand, uh, Ferdinand's first meeting with Stambolov, the Bulgarian uh, politician at that time, who was looking for a Bulgarian king, happened. Do you know this story? And uh, yeah, what's, yes, I know, what's, yeah, I know this story, and this story is, of course, is of course not true. Not true. It's, you can <laughs> it, you, yeah. you, you can find uh, it quite well uh, explained and expressed uh, in the books by by Professor Stojanovic, mm -hmm. uh, who, who made a very, very excellent and detailed biography of Ferdinand with uh, all, all necessary resources. So the Bulgarian delegation after, after the overthrow of Battenberg was really visiting uh, all European capitals. And among those capitals, of course, also Vienna, capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire at that day, time, they had a meeting with Count Kalnoki, who was the Minister of Foreign Affairs at that time, and got yeah, friendly words, but not more. But they decided to stay in Vienna, and then they got approached by an officer, Major von Laber, who was the personal adjutant of Ferdinand, who invited them to Palais Coburg for the next morning. There are speculations about the exact meeting of this Ayolava with the Bulgarian delegation. Uh, probably it was at the Burgtheater, probably it was at the Ronacher, which had been also theater, probably it had been in the Café Landmann. It doesn't matter at all. Ferdinand was not present then. Mm -hmm. So the real meeting between the Bulgarian delegation, Ferdinand, and the key figure uh, uh, in the Bulgarian project, Princess Clementine Dorlian, Ferdinand's mother, happened on the next day in December 1886. Yeah, that's that's his mother. Yeah, in Palico. That's his mother. So maybe, maybe here is the place uh, for you to say a few words about his uh, early, uh, Ferdinand's early Viennese uh, period before his reign uh, in Bulgaria? Ferdinand was the fifth and youngest son of Clementine d'Orléans, daughter of Louis Philippe, the last king of France, and Duke August of Saxe-Coburg, the head of the Kohari branch of the Saxe-Coburg family. The Kohari branch was maybe uh, the richest part of the family. It was established by the marriage of Ferdinand's grandfather, Ferdinand Georg of Saxe-Coburg, with the Hungarian heiress Maria Antonia Kohari. The Kuharis had been an enormously wealthy Hungarian magnates family. Wealthy concerning land, about 250,000 hectares, but even more important had been uh, their mining and iron activities. So they had been really great early iron industrial magnates. So mm -hmm. uh, the company later was named Coburg Steel and uh, they made the, the, the rails for the Hungarian railway, for instance. So it was really a big, huge enterprise and I tried to estimate the wealth of Maria Antonia Kohari at the moment of the marriage. And you know how hard it is to, to exchange rates from a historic currency to today, but I tried it and I would say she inherited a fortune of 8 billion euros. At that so time? Was, at that time. So it was really, really a huge, huge fortune. and. Uh, Ferdinand's father was the heir of this fortune and together with Clementine they had five children. First two sons, then two daughters, then a 14-year break and then Clementine decided she wanted another child. She wanted a fifth child. She was already 43 and we know from very private letters from the from the mother of Emperor Franz Josef, the Emperor of Austria, who was a close friend 
uh, Ferdinand's parent to his mother that uh, Duke August, Ferdinand's father, has told him that Clementine had suffered several miscarriages already. But she insisted on the child. She got the help of a young doctor, Carl Brown, who became very, very important for medicine history after the birth of Ferdinand. Because he helped Clementine in this last pregnancy, delivered a healthy boy, 1861, a few months before Clementine's 44th birthday. Just imagine, she was 44 and we are in the year 1861. So the doctor was very, very famous after that. Clementine supported him, he became a close friend of her and he later founded, thanks to Clementine's support, uh, the first scientific institution of gynecology. So mm -hmm. Ferdinand birth was the beginning of gynecology as a medical science. I mean, isn't that, isn't that amazing? Yes. Yeah, also, uh, there is one very curious picture of uh, his mother. She's wearing, as far as I know, Bulgarian uniform. What, what's her role in that regard? Clementine had, of course, a very, very close relation to this, to this boy who was born under such difficult circumstances. So uh, the, the relation between mother and son was really, really close. And Clementine had one trauma, the revolution of 1848, when her father, Louis Philippe, lost the French throne. So she wanted that her family the Orléans, they will get a crown. And so it was her ambition that her youngest son, her favorite son, will add a crown to the yeah, throne collection of the Coburgs. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, the Coburgs at this time had the crowns of Belgium, Portugal, and the UK. And when there was the overthrow of Alexander von Battenberg. She saw a chance that the throne of this country, Bulgaria, she had no idea about Bulgaria at that moment. Neither had Ferdinand could fulfill this dream. So the story which fascinates me since I, I started to work on it, they did not know the country mm -hmm. when they started this concept of throne candidature, yeah? And when it came out, Ferdinand made a press release after the Bulgarian delegation has left the Palais Coburg. It was written in the, in the Austrian newspaper and it was like throwing a, a hand grenade into the European politics. So everybody was shouting, are you crazy? Are you totally crazy? Yeah? So, Emperor Franz Josef from the beginning, the head of the Coburg family, Duke Ernst II, Queen Victoria, she was the closest friend of Clementine. They wrote to each other all the time. She wrote to Clementine, how can you have such an idea? We will not support you. So it was really like everybody was just shaking the head to have such an idea. This young prince goes to... Uh, a country which was a synonym of, of, of crisis at that time. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew that Russia, the, the really complicated Alexander III, was behind the overthrow of Battenberg. Yeah. But Clementine used all her charm, all her skills, and all the support that in a incredible, crazy six months, I mean, if I would like, if we can't talk about it, we would need hours to explain this Game of Thrones uh, from the first half of 1887 uh, till the, the, the election of Ferdinand at the Sobrania in, in Veliko Tarnovo happened, and then Ferdinand leaving for Bulgaria, and two months later, Clementine joining him there. And what happened then? It's from my perspective, please allow to say me to that, really a miracle because both Ferdinand as well as his mother, I would even say Clementine more, he totally fell in love with the country. 
So when we read the letters of Clementine to Queen Victoria, how she writes about Bulgaria, how much she deeply loved the people, the landscape, being there. It's really, it's really, it's really touching. I would call it, I really would call it a, a, a love story. Hmm. Uh, will I be wrong if I conclude that the fact of uh, Ferdinand becoming Bulgarian king was actually an act of a uh, rebel against the European concert of that time, at, uh, at that time, against the interests and the will of the great powers of Europe at that time. Is it correct to conclude like that? I say this is correct. They went without the support of any power. The only monarch writing to Ferdinand at the day when he left Austria, because uh, he left from Ebenthal Castle, which is about 40 kilometers, 35 kilometers east from Vienna, which was the, the summer residence of the Coburgs. She left, he left there in the morning uh, by train to, to Orsheva uh, at the Danube, where he entered the Bulgarian Danube, Danube boat. Mm -hmm. The only one writing him was Emperor Franz Josef, mm -hmm. who knew him since he was born. And Franz Josef wrote a private letter. He said, I can't support you politically. Of course he couldn't, but uh, I wish you all the best. And no one, no European power would say that he will survive longer than three months there. And yet, he is a controversial uh, figure in Bulgaria. Uh, even some say that uh, if he had finished his reign uh, after the first 25 years on the throne, he would have remained a legend in Bulgaria. But the following years, associated with the defeat in the First World War, the so-called Big War at that time, uh, and the, natural, uh, the national catastrophe that followed the First World War, uh, it casted a shadow over his reign. Are we Bulgarians harsh, a bit harsh uh, in our assessment of Ferdinand's case, uh, seen from European perspective? He became definitely a scapegoat later, definitely. But, I mean, you must not forget the, the really difficult, extremely difficult political situation of the whole region at that time. I don't know where shall we start. Shall we start? At the time of the of the Ottoman occupation, 1876-77, Congress of Berlin overthrow of uh, Battenberg and so on. The 1908 Young Turks Revolution, uh, trying to reestablish the Ottoman power with a new concept, Turkish nationalism. First Balkan War, Second Balkan War. Uh, we can discuss hours who started the First World War. I just referred to the great, great book of Sleepwalkers by Christopher Clark. Everybody should read that, interested in that period, who starts the story with the regicide of Belgrade, 1903. So the history is really, really complicated. I would say we have to separate Ferdinand. Yeah, there is the political Ferdinand. We can dispute if this, this claiming that he's responsible is right or wrong. Yeah, there's the one figure. The other one is, is Ferdinand the modernizer. Ferdinand who may brought Bulgaria into the family of European nations, who really established uh, or transformed the country with an enormous speed, who really, he and his mother became <laughs> centers of, of uh, cultural interaction mm -hmm. of uh, Bulgaria with especially Central Europe. So when I love Sofia very much and I like it to walk through the streets of Sofia and wherever I look, I find a little bit of Vienna, a little bit of Budapest there. So the political Ferdinand, something we can discuss. We have to discuss, of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's complicated story really really complicated i would not be that harsh uh giving him the whole responsibility the other one that's the the cultural ferdinand 
and this row is undisputable. So it's really, really, really a great, a great contribution. And we must not forget, again, the role of his mother, Clementine. Clementine, due to French domestic politics. That's the fascinating thing about Ferdinand. It really links uh, Bulgaria with all of Europe. And Ferdinand, uh, Ferdinand's mother, she inherited 1874 uh, the Orléans money, which was huge. So there is one speculation in an Austrian newspaper that it had been 30 million gold francs, which would be 13 tons of gold. So I took the weight of a gold franc and, and, and tried to find out how much it would be. So it was a speculation in a newspaper. I can't say if it's correct, but I know from other sources that she had invested in the Wall Street. She was the majority owner of the New York Philadelphia Railway. She had a broker in New York in the 1880s. What a woman. I mean, she really is, is, is an amazing figure. And most of her money she invested in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. So she was one of the greatest investors in uh, the country in the 18, late 1880s, early 1890s. So this contribution of, of, of transforming, modernizing is huge. And till today you find what she done. She found hospitals, girls' schools. She brought the Christmas tree, one of the nice side stories uh, to Bulgaria. So the first Christmas tree was brought by Clementine. 1887, if you read the newspapers, everybody was talking about this new fashion, this new custom coming yeah. from, from, from Europe. The yellow also, street. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. This is what I was thinking, this yellow paves, you know, yellow pavement of uh, downtown Sofia, the center of Sofia. Where I grew up in Austria, we paved uh, the, the uh, other streets with that. It, they had been produced in... Uh, near Znoimo, nowadays Czech Republic. Yeah, so we know it's called Shatova Pflaster, from Shatov near Znoimo. So it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's such an interesting exchange. And also from that time, we must not forget the, the, all the great Bulgarian architects from after 1900. They have studied in Vienna or Budapest. So mm -hmm. Vienna became uh, one of the uh, centers for, for, for Bulgarian scholars where they went to university, where they get education. Yes. Uh, but very, very close connection. Uh, yet, uh, does it strike you, for me at least, it's out of question, I don't question it, you know, deeply, uh, how little we know about precisely this part of our own Bulgarian history. Uh, I'm quite sure that you know why this is so, because of the so-called Iron Curtain, uh, which, apart from separating us from the rest of the European world, so to say, uh, and our roots, of course, <clears throat> it partially or entirely erased or changed uh, our history from that time. Uh, in Austria, however, as far as I know, the treatment of the nobles was no better. You will correct me if I'm wrong. In Germany, at least, uh, the noble titles, they remained part of their names afterwards. Uh, however, where is the main difference in the Republican approach in our country and in the German-speaking world? These are lots, lots of diff difficult questions. Lots of difficult questions as once, nearly, nearly not answerable. Let's say that way. Uh, please allow me a personal personal yeah. opinion, the 20th century was not the most glorious one for Central and Eastern Europe. Actually, we had been stumbling from one catastrophe to the next. World War mm -hmm. I, uh, economic crisis in Austria and Germany, the rise of fascism, national socialism, uh, the terrible crimes of Holocaust and Shoah, Second World War, then after the Second World War, the separation of, of Europe, I grew up less than a kilometer from the Iron Curtain. So I live in Vienna and at the Czech border. And I will never forget 
this it was like a wound being there looking to uh czech republic and knowing i have no chance to go there and when there was the Velvet revolution and the people from the neighboring town in czech republic which i could see but i knew i couldn't go there because there had been watchtowers and soldiers and all that when suddenly the iron curtain vanished and they came and we fall each other in our arms celebrating the end of division we are only looking to berlin we don't look to the other countries who enjoyed so much happiness that the separation is over uh nevertheless the separation had been there and we have to learn so much of each other i know it when i made give lectures in austria about bulgarian history the people are surprised that we have this close connection due to ferdinand and i found it now quite interesting that ferdinand was always called a german prince no he had the the austro-hungarian citizenship he was a uh, uh an officer in the austro-hungarian army before he went to to uh, bulgaria in the vrana palace his passport is exhibited from that time it was uh issued by franz josef as king of hungary he got a german passport after 1918 to travel but before he went to bulgaria he was uh from the citizenship Hungarian, so to say. Mm. Uh, so much we we need we need to know. We need to learn. This late nineteenth century is so fascinating, but complicated. You don't find uh, black and white if 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 we look in that time. And this is maybe the reason why we have these misunderstandings. And it's easy after the fall of of monarchy, the new systems need to separate from the past by interpreting the past in not a positive way to say it that way. This happened in Austria after 1918. Uh, then after the end of the Second World War, especially in the 1950s, to establish an Austrian national identity, the time of the monarchy became a very idealized kitsch <laughs> like a Sissi movie, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. glorifying of a past which was not correct, but not telling about the greatness of, uh, of some aspects uh, of, of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. All this is now rediscovered by scholars, especially in other parts of, uh, uh, of Europe. I wouldn't say that it, we have to learn so much about our past. So we don't want to, that, that, that's quite interesting. You say, if I get you uh, correctly, uh, that it's not only that our so-called eastern part of Europe or that part which was under the communist reign at that time, but also the West, Western Europe also rediscovers its own history or at least reevaluates its own history after the end of the communist era. Is it so? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Especially, especially the links we have. Yeah and uh we and with we i mean also austria and our neighboring countries and including including bulgaria uh, we need to learn more about each other because the, the the links have been broken and are now growing together again and hmm. so back at this funeral you know, yep. this funeral is historic because it reminds people of the connection. It was interesting what was said at the ceremony in Coburg in the church. There had been three speeches. One, the mayor of Coburg, the Bulgarian ambassador, and a member of the parish. And all three said, Ferdinand is a symbol of friendship and connection between Bulgaria and Germany. Hmm. So, so you were you were from the very last uh, uh, first very first to the very last moment of that uh, international ceremony so to say 
uh, the return of the remains of uh, Ferdinand to Bulgaria. Uh, I'd like to show this picture, it's from Bulgaria. Uh, there it is. This is you accompanied by uh, Bulgarian King uh, Simeon, Simon. That's you mm -hmm. uh, on the right side. So my question mm -hmm. is, um, could you tell please our viewers about the organization and what were the most critical moments in this uh, overall procedure? Uh, we should mention that the attempt to return uh, Ferdinand's remains uh, to Bulgaria was uh, was not a single day issue. It was uh, it goes on since uh, 2011, 2011, and this was the second, hopefully successful attempt. So, what were the most uh, crucial and critical points of the whole procedure? I would like to answer that, but I'm afraid I can't answer that because I was not in the organization team. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I had this incredible experience was that I supported a Bulgarian film team, I know since years, uh, in the organization of uh, interviews, filming locations in Coburg and all that stuff. So doing research on Coburg history, of course, I know people in Coburg as well as, 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 as of course, also in Vienna, because we filmed also here in, in Vienna. So this was how I had the honor to become a witness of these historic events, which I will never forget for the rest of my life. I would say this had been one of the most intense moments uh, I've ever experienced but I was not an organizer. So I would like to answer it, but I can't give you a correct answer. So please accept it. Absolutely no problem. That's also, you know, the, the attitude, the emotions which uh, it brought to you. This is also a good answer, good, good point. Uh, yet, we are, I'll drag you back to the political field, so to say, considering that you're not a politician. But uh, we are in the process of European elections right now. Next Sunday, we will be voting in Bulgaria. Uh, the last uh, heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Otto von Habsburg, he was one of the main drivers of European unification and a member of European Parliament as well. Uh, but now, nowadays, the populism dominates the political narrative. What lesson can we learn from uh, the old European rulers? Otto von Habsburg is a fantastic person. I mean, really, uh, I am a very close friend of his assistant, Eva Demmele. She spent more or less the last 15 years of his life with him. And he told she told me lots of stories uh, about about this great man, Otto von Habsburg, he was both, he was the true heir of the Austrian emperors. And when we speak about Austria, Austria is not the name of the Republic, but this is an artificial name created 1918. So he's a descendant of the Habsburgs, of the Chemis Leeds, of the Arpads, so related to all dynasties. He had this really Central European uh, mindset and he made it he find for himself a role being a Habsburg politician in a post-monarchist way. So he said, I want to serve my peoples, my peoples from the empire uh, in the best way I could and the best way I can is uh, European unification. Otto did so much we have forgotten. So what I like is an act he did in the European Parliament in the mid 1980s. He brought an empty chair and put it in the center of Parliament. And he asked, him, What are you doing? And he said, This is the chair for the European nations who can be with us because they are behind the Iron Curtain. So hmm. he was ambassador of a greater Europe. A Europe, he said, Europe is more than the West long before 1989 long before 1989 we must not forget that and so this knowing he always said we have to know our roots to prepare for the presence for the future he was not reactionary he was not dreaming of 
a new of a past which is over he says how can we transform these values for our modern time and there is also the close connection between Otto von Habsburg and, and King Simeon so they knew each other from a very 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 early age on and and Simeon always refers refers very often to Otto von Habsburg and how he teach him inspired him uh, to find a new role in a in a changed in a changed era hmm. and I think that if we talk about history history can unite people it, it's not history was abused in the 19th century to create nationalism and now history can do it was it opposite. was abused after the end of the world war ii also the history was abused severely abused in my opinion and we can use it this is my experience that mm -hmm. history brings people together so whenever i do i do a lot of projects with cobalt connection yeah and I see how the people are interested when their region yeah. is linked to a dynasty with other parts. Okay, so. let's go to 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 the end of our conversation. This sentence is quite quite good. I think I could even use it for a title of our conversation for uh, from today. Uh, the history can unite. So uh, I will show again. This is uh, his birthplace, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, please. The Ferdinand's birthplace. Uh, yeah. And also, this is one uh, very good image of him, uh, old image of him, that's him. Uh, how the history of uh, Ferdinand, the way he became Bulgarian king, uh, even the way what happened with his uh, remains after his death, the way that, uh, you know, I mean, the, the fact that he went to, he wasn't accepted in Austria, Austria, he went to Germany, and then so many years after his death, he was moved back to his body, was, his remains were moved back to uh, Bulgaria. What do we teach from this history? And uh, yeah, what, how, can, how can we work in that direction, you know, that history unites us, not separates us? We haven't spoken about another country, which is very important, okay. Slovakia. Slovakia. Because yeah, he spent exile half of the year in Coburg, the other half in Slovakia. In Slovakia, he is unforgotten. In Slovakia, there is a lots of institution groups who are, who are remembering Ferdinand. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, uh, they want to do uh, hiking trails, rediscovering Coburg routes. So huge interest there. There is even a beautiful video made where old Ferdinand revisits the castles he loved in Slovakia so much. So he is very, very, he's unforgotten in central Slovakia till today. So you see, it's not only two countries. We are already at four countries, Bulgaria, Germany, Austria, Slovakia. And if you continue with it, with the, 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 the family of Carlos, suddenly we find even a route to Brazil because his brother uh, was married to the daughter of the emperor of Brazil and he should become the, the, the father of the Brazilian crown prince. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, We have the Belgian connection, the Portuguese connection, the British connection, and, 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 and. so if you, if you see it, you see this, this history as the history of a, of, of a network, we finally see, hey, we can use this network and tell each other about the stories we know. Hmm. There, and there the even, other, sorry. In Swati Anton, for instance, you find a Bulgarian room packed with uh, artifacts from, from Bulgaria, presents he received when he was already in exile. Mm -hmm. Where I am from, this area north of, of Vienna, there is an old Kohari crypt and uh, which is surrounded by a fence. And my good friend Peter Stojanovic visited me one day and I showed him the crypt because he wanted to see it. And he said, have you seen? There is the Kyrillic monogram of Ferdinand on that 
fan. So I had no idea about it. Suddenly you find it there. Yeah. So if we look closer, we will, we will can take this person of Ferdinand and say, Hey, he, he, he brings mm -hmm. us together. As far as I know, the Slovaks, they also had a desire that uh, his remains were moved and buried in Slovakia. And also some say that that was actually his last will. Would you comment on that? I would say they, my friends in Slovakia, they showed me the, the very special cemetery he wanted to be buried. And it's in a very, very small village named Slakno. Beautiful place with a wonderful view to the Kralova Ola. Which is the was the famous, the favorite mountain in the Tatra region of Ferdinand. So he really loved the region there, and also his valet is from that village with whom he was close connected. And what I say now, it's a it's a personal opinion. I did not do research yet, so it's a mm -hmm. it's an opinion mm -hmm. and interpretation. After what happened with Ferdinand's both son. First, the death of Boris III under unclear circumstances, and then the really tragic death of his second son, Kirill, the regent, the overthrow of the monarchy. I think he had, he was totally in, in despair, and he said, I will never have a chance to go to my beloved Bulgarian, so he said the Slatno wish. Slatno would not fit at all for Ferdinand. So being in a small village cemetery, no, this is not Ferdinand. I think what happened in the last days, this was exactly he yeah, wanted. Too, too small for, for his person. Yeah. Uh, but still, it's an expression, it's an expression of his love for Slovakia. So it's 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 Yeah, I see, uh, I see. Okay, uh, at, 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 the, say that. at the very end of the, the conversation we are having, uh, I'm sorry, but I will bring it down again to the political level. So we have a lot of a lot a lot a lot in common. Uh, even you added, you know, Brazil, Slovakia to to this uh, complicated and yet beautiful relationship, so to say. But uh, nowadays. Sorry for that question, but I had to ask it. It won't be, you know, the, the conversation won't be full. Uh, the attitude of Austria uh, uh, in relation to Bulgaria, the Austria's veto of, Bulga veto of Bulgarian succession to Schengen area. Uh, we, Bulgarians, we uh, define it as unfair to us. What's, uh, what's your opinion on that? How does it look in your eyes? I am I am not a politician, but knowing your country very very well, and really I have to say, I love I love Bulgaria. I love being in Bulgaria. So everything which overshadows our relation makes me not happy. Günther Furman from uh, from uh, Vienna, Austria, on the topic of uh, returning of the remains of uh, King Ferdinand to Bulgaria. Thank you very much for being on my show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Това беше днешния епизод на Контракоментар. Надявам се, че успяхме, макар и в този кратък разговор, да хвърлим достатъчно светлина върху значението на това събитие, връщането на клените останки на цар Фердинанд в България, от един изразено мнение от един събеседник, който е посветил съществена част от своя живот именно на изследване на този исторически период и на тези исторически събития. Благодаря ви много. Ще се, върна, ще се видим отново утре с поредния епизод на Контракоментар и с новия актуален гост по темите, които ни интересуват всички нас. Лека вечер и късмет!